open in your copy of God's Word to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah, you can find that. It's the, the, in the Minor Prophets, so towards the end of the Old Testament, on page, uh, what is it in the Pew Bible? 726, and then 920 in the large print. 726 or 920, looking at Jonah. You know, it's a good idea at some point in your life, if you haven't done it already, to memorize the, the order of the books of the Bible, if for no other reason than uh, these little minor prophets, they, they tend to be hard to find. You, you get them mixed up. So if you, if you memorize the order, you can remember Jonah, Micah, and Nahum, and so on and so forth. But Jonah is easy to miss. It's just four chapters. And this morning, we'll only be looking at the first chapter, focusing on verses 1 through 3, though we will read through to the end of the chapter for some context. Again, this is Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. These are not the words of men. This is not the idea of an aged holy man, but this is the very word of God. The very word of God for Israel, the very word of God for the Israel of his church. It's your word. It's a word for you, so give attention now to the reading of it. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told it to them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will be quiet, will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord appointed a giant fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish Three days and three nights. The word of the Lord. Some of you have heard, I think, the story of Dr. Richard Kimball. He was a brilliant vascular surgeon from Chicago, falsely accused of murdering his own wife and sentenced to death. But Dr. Kimball escaped captivity and spent the next several months running away from the authorities, running, in fact, for his life. He was sentenced to death. All the time, he was attempting to clear his good name. You may also know that Dr. Kimball is entirely fictional. 
He was played by Harrison Ford in 1993's The Fugitive, which was based on the 1960s TV series by the same name. Even so, I think the movie, and, and perhaps the TV show, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but the, it gives a very true picture of the fear and exhaustion that characterizes a man on the run. A man who is running away from something much bigger, faster, and stronger than himself. In Harrison Ford's case, it was Tommy Lee Jones, and you can see him running through the forest away from the dogs and all the police officers and the helicopters, and he's terrified and exhausted. I'm sure many of you have heard also then the story of Jonah, or at least I've heard about Jonah. It's a short book, only four chapters, but it's a vivid story about a man on the run. It's a story that has captured the imaginations of people for thousands of years, actually thousands of years, but it's also one of the favorite targets of skeptics and scholars. There is a, a considerable a group of people who look at the story of Jonah and see this as no different than the story of Richard Kimball. It's a fiction. It's a fable. You tell your kids, oh, a prophet swallowed by a giant whale or a fish of some kind. You could see why they would pick this book as a target for skepticism. I mean, as the text says, Jonah was inside the fish for three entire days. As I'm reading through uh, Moby Dick, you, you get the sense from the skeptic Herman Melville. He says, you know, this is just frankly impossible. I know a lot about whales, and this does not happen. If Jonah was inside the whale for three days, that's absurd. He'd be as good as dead, and we know full well that nobody comes back from the dead. So they say. It's a good thing that skeptical opinion never seemed to hinder the Almighty God. He is, as Jonah confesses, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. He rules the stars. He counts the sand. He stirs up the storms, and he is the one who tells them to be still. And that really runs to the heart of what the book of Jonah is about. If you want to know what the book of Jonah is about, I'm going to give you a hint. It's not about a giant fish. The fish is a secondary or a tertiary character, in fact. No, the book of Jonah is a true history, but it's also a teaching history. Just like the book of Samuel, it teaches that God is mighty, ruling over both heaven and earth, both the plants and the animals are his domain, and yet even more than that, the book of Jonah teaches that this almighty, all-powerful, all-pervasive God is gracious and merciful slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. One of the reasons I chose this text is, as we saw last week, God's severe judgment on the Amalekites. It's important as we even see a picture of God's severe judgment, we also see pictures of God's severe mercy, both to the Ninevites and to Jonah, the prophet himself. As Mr. Beaver says to Lucy in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, oh, he isn't safe, but he is good. He's the king. But how do we get there? How do we know that this God who isn't safe is still good? How do we see this fish? Why the fish? Why the storm? Why Jonah? Why Nineveh? This morning, we'll find the answers to those questions in focusing on the first few verses of the chapter, which not only set the stage for Jonah and for Nineveh, but also show us the character and the compassion that God has for sinners. Sinners in Israel and in Nineveh, sinners in your neighborhood, sinners like you and like me. Look again to verse 1. As we see this morning, the Lord says, Arise! says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, there are parables in the Bible. Anytime we talk about, do you take the Bible literally? Well, there are parts of the Bible that are metaphors. There are parts of the Bible that didn't necessarily happen. There are parables, things like the, the parable of the sower or the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It's not that Jesus is saying those were things that actually happened. He's telling us a story to make a point. But this story gives us no grounds to think it's a parable. 
This is a very standard and technical way for the Bible to introduce history. Now this happened. Now the word of the Lord came. This is standard for the Bible. The prophet himself is identified from the get-go as a real person, not some mythical character. This is Jonah, son of Amittai, verse 1. And that locates him in history. Specifically, we find that this Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14 prophesying in Israel during the reign of Jeroboam II. That's about 200 years after King David, 50 years before the fall of the northern kingdom, Israel, which would be conquered by Assyria. So not long before Israel's downfall to Assyria, you could say it's the tail end of a bad run for Israel. They have had faithless king after faithless king Yet Jonah follows immediately on the footsteps of the great prophets Elijah and Elisha. You remember the the way that Elijah fought against Jezebel and, and Ahab and the Baal prophets, Elisha, how he brought back a boy from the dead and how he, he stood up against great forces in opposition, proclaiming God's word to unfaithful Israelites in the northern kingdom. Jonah follows in their footsteps. All the while, evil king after evil king turns further and further away from the Lord. And yet, even in the accounts of Jonah's lifetime, we find that God is good. He is good. Even to the unjust and the wicked, he is good. We find that the reign of Jeroboam II was just as bad as the rest, but it was during that time that God used this evil king to keep Israel afloat and even shored up their borders. They prospered under Jeroboam II, an evil king. This is how God works. God blesses even the unjust, even those who decide to go their own way, even those who depart from his will, he still shows grace to them and mercy. And goodness, he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's actually a phrase that God uses to reveal his goodness to Moses on Mount Sinai. After Israel crafted the golden calf and worshipped it. And God says, I am a God who is to be known as gracious and merciful. The Bible will pick up that phrase. God will pick up that phrase and remind Israel again and again and again. Who am I? I am a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And the prophet Jonah, you can bet, knew it by heart. As we can even see later in the book of Jonah, he had it memorized. This this attribute of God, this this is a character, an attribute of God, his goodness, his mercy, This is what characterizes God. This is how God reveals himself. And no doubt, Jonah delighted in this character trait, this attribute of God, when he was preaching it to the people of Israel. But our story begins in a different place. Jonah preached God's mercy to Israel, but now Jonah is called by the same God, the same mercy, to a different people. Go to Nineveh that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, you may read that and say, well, that doesn't sound particularly merciful. I mean, if I came up to you and I said, well, whew, you stink. I mean, that's kind of mean, actually. It's not very nice. But your point in telling me that I stink, which I hope you do if I do, is to show me that I am in some way needing correction. There's a problem that you are calling to my attention that to everyone else seems obvious, but to me me is, is I am completely oblivious. You see, God is not calling out Nineveh just for the sake of rubbing it in their nose. God is calling out Nineveh as an act of mercy. God is calling Nineveh to repent. Nineveh, that great city, he says if they're not going to repent, judgment day is coming. Who was Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the enemies of God's people. You thought the Amalekites were bad. The Ninevites bragged about how they tortured their enemies alive and then placed their heads on pikes outside the city. 
The Ninevites bragged about their cruelty. They worshipped false gods. They had no regard for the Lord of heaven and earth. Nineveh is not a part of Israel, not a part of Judah, not a part of God's chosen people as it were. They showed no mercy and yet God has designed to show mercy to them. God knows. In fact, he even tells Jonah later in the book. These are people who are so hardened. They have so cut themselves off from my plain grace that is revealed. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies above proclaim his handiwork. They have so cut themselves off from what is manifestly true by nature. God says in chapter 4, they don't even know their right hand from their left. That's a metaphor to show that Nineveh was morally debased. And God's people sometimes look at the morally debased in the world and they laugh or they sneer and they say, look at these people, how foolish they are. And Sometimes we forget the heart that God has for these wicked who do not know their right hand from their left. Some people, when I said that I was coming to California to serve in an internship, some people joked back east. They said, ha, so I guess you're going to Nineveh then. You're going to San Francisco. You're going to the Bay Area. That great city full of so much debauchery, debased. They don't care about God. Oh, that's going to be hard ground. And they they meant it, I think, in in the best spirit possible. But I, I think we often miss the grace and the tone of mercy. What does God think about San Francisco? What does God think about Pittsburgh? What does God think about Antioch? What does God think about our cities where people don't know their right hand from their left, morally speaking? Well, God tells us in the book of Jonah, he says, their evil has come up before me. I've seen it. And I want them to repent because if they don't, I'm going to judge them. Jonah was called to go to this, as it were, an unreached people group. But of course, we find Jonah in verse 2 in parallel language to God's call running away. God says, arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah arises to flee to Tarshish. The language is jarring. And the passage makes it abundantly clear. Jonah is fleeing to Tarshish. He's getting up and going away from the presence of the Lord. And so he found a ship to go to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down in the ship to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. It's an about face, a complete turnaround, away from the direction that God has called him. Now, Nineveh was 500 miles northeast of Israel. Tarshish, as some scholars think, was in Spain, 2,000 miles to the west. Jonah is trying to get as far away from Nineveh as he possibly can. But there's a problem. Jonah, like every other Israelite of his day, should have known that God is omnipresent. It's another attribute of God. Omnipresent. In other words, he is all present, everywhere present. There is nowhere where there is not God. This doctrine clearly displayed in, in, in throughout Scripture, particularly in Psalm 139, which Jonah should have known full well. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, in the grave, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. So you may be saying to yourself, well, Jonah, this is frankly a very silly thing for a prophet of God to do. Don't you know better? Don't you know that God is everywhere? Don't you know that you can't run away from God, the omnipresent one? But Jonah is not necessarily running away from God in that way. Jonah knows that God is the God who is there. He's the God of heaven. He's there. He's the God 
who created the earth, he's there. Jonah knows he cannot escape God himself, but he's going to do everything he can to escape God's call. God's call on his life. God's presence. I think that's what it means when he refers to twice in this passage to the presence of the Lord. He's talking about the calling of the prophet, which is nothing less than the calling of the Christian in this sense. is a calling where the Lord God who made heaven and earth is present with you in fellowship, in communion, in relationship, with obligations, yes, but with gracious relationship. God calls the Christian in a way that God calls the prophet to service, yes, to, to devotion, to obedience, to faith. That is the presence of the Lord, the blessed presence of the Lord, the fellowship with the Lord that Jonah is fleeing. He's a fugitive. By fleeing the presence of the Lord, Jonah is saying, no, God, no, not this time. I've obeyed you in the past. But this goes too far. This goes too far, and I am going to have nothing to do with it. And so he goes down. You notice the trajectory of Jonah is made clear even in the text. He's going down to Joppa. He goes down into the boat. He goes down to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. When God's word is clear, and clearly, manifestly not what we want, it is a strong temptation to go down and to go down and to sink down and further down away from the presence of the Lord. I've heard it likened to turning the volume down on God. A little bit softer, a little bit softer. I want to hear this a little bit less until I hear it not at all, the will and word of God. Now, the question at this point, we know what Jonah is doing, but why is he doing it? Why was Jonah running away from God? Why was this particular call so hard for the prophet? Remember, Jonah lived during the time of Jeroboam II. I don't think it was all sunshine and rainbows for him. And yet, this was a bridge too far. Now, was it because he was afraid of the Assyrians? Perhaps he was afraid of them. They were a very ferocious enemy of God's people. Prophets didn't always do well in Israel. One can only imagine what would happen to a prophet of God in Nineveh, that godless city. Would you be eager to go to Afghanistan or North Korea? This is, this is the, kind of, the kind of city that, that Jonah was called to go to. But even if he was scared, I don't think that's the main reason why he was refusing to go. I think that's made clear to us at the end of the book again in chapter 4. Just turn your eye over to chapter 4. If you, I, I hope you keep your Bibles open as we're looking at this, but look at chapter 4, verse... Actually, look to, to chapter 3, verse 10 to begin. Chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, spoiler alert, Nineveh, spoiler alert, Nineveh repents. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. You see, Jonah was not afraid that he would fail. He was afraid that he would succeed. He doesn't want the Assyrians to repent. He doesn't want San Francisco to repent. He doesn't want the pagans to repent. He wants them to burn. Just like all the towns and villages and people that the Assyrians had burned. He may have known Psalm 139 well enough, but he focused more on the verses that I haven't read yet, this is the same psalm. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. 
They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. But of course, the greatest danger for the prophet of God and for the people of God is to take the parts of Scripture we like and to leave the rest. God will judge the guilty, those who remain outside of faith, those who remain outside of Christ. But today is the day, he says, of salvation. Today is the day of mercy. Today is the day where he longs for the sinners to repent. And we, at times, find not the same longing, but instead we want to just hasten the judgment. Bring it on, God. Why have you waited this long? If the enemy repents for Jonah, in his case, if they call out to the Lord, if Nineveh is spared, what will that mean for Israel? It's important to remember, again, this is not just a a simple history. It's a true history, but it's a teaching history. It's a history for the people of God, for Israel, in the first instance. Whenever we do a Bible study or whenever we look at the Bible and read it for ourselves, we need to ask, how would the original hearers have heard this? Well, who was the original hearer in Jonah's day? Godless Israel. So what happens if Nineveh repents and God's people are the godless ones? It would mean that the most evil and hostile nation in the ancient world, the strongest nation in the world, would have a second chance to annihilate the northern kingdom. Jonah knows that his people are sinners. He knows that God's judgment is coming. He knows that they ultimately have not been trusting and repenting And to see Nineveh repent when God's people perish? No, that's not acceptable. So Jonah does the only thing he can do. He runs, he flees away from the presence of the Lord. Just notice here before we move on uh, in our outline, if you're following along, there's a, a third point we need to notice here is how Jonah runs away. And just two things to note about this. I think you could maybe draw out some more. But, but notice that he's going down to Joppa And as he goes down to Joppa, he's looking for a ship to Tarshish, and he finds it. The first way that Jonah runs is by justifying himself by looking at God's providence. I think this is a way that that we can fall into. At times, we want to depart from God's will. God's made something plain in our lives. We don't like it. And we look for every means of justification to show, ah, but that's not what God really asked for. I, I haven't thankfully encountered it myself yet, although I'm not foolish enough to think I won't encounter it, but I I hear pastors say that this is an argument they hear in marital counseling. Well, of course God wants me to divorce my wife and marry this other woman because he's just shown me in the ways that we click and the the, the circumstances and, and providence shows me that I belong with this woman and not my wife. What has God said? Husbands love your wives. And yet we use God's providence, so to say, to to justify our sin. Jonah looks for Tarshish and so he finds it. Christians and non-Christians this morning, if you are not trusting in Jesus, if you are looking for ways to sin, you'll find ample justification. It's there. It's going to be there. The ship to Tarshish will be waiting for you. Don't fool yourself and think that it's God's will. What has he told you? What has been clear? Don't discard the clear commands of God for your wishful thinking because that was Jonah's fault. That was his first way that he ran away. But there's a second, and again, as we we talked about it in a, a little bit, but just notice the way where Jonah is in the ship. He's hiding. Now, it says that Jonah is asleep. I don't know if he was actually fully asleep, but It's possible he could have been asleep in the storm. But why would Jonah sneak onto the ship and go down and go down and go down into the ship? It's because he's ashamed. And he says as much as he confesses to the sailors on the ship. He's hiding in the dark. And again, this is a way that we run away from God. We think we can hide from him. God's not going to be there in my circle of friends. God's not going to be there in that conversation. God's not going to be there in that room that late at night 
God's not going to be there. I can hide from him. You're fooling yourself. Jonah was fooling himself. Even as the world was, was literally being rocked around him, he was fooling himself. And just like if you know the meme where there's the dog surrounded by fire, you know that, younger people might know that. It just says, everything is fine. Everything is fine. When it's not fine. It's not fine, Jonah. You think you can hide in the dark, but it's not fine. God dwells in the dark. And he exposes it. In any case, those were the ways that Jonah attempted to run. But now we look thirdly to this glorious and great conjunction. You know what a conjunction is, right? Conjunction, junction, what is your function, right? Schoolhouse rock. Conjunction that joins together. In Hebrew, conjunctions are, are kind of up to interpretation. Sometimes they come across as an and. I think in this case, it's a but. A great and glorious, yet, yet God, but the Lord. What do we find God doing in this passage? We find God implementing his great rescue plan for Nineveh and for Jonah in this great and glorious conjunction, this, this but, this yet, God makes it clear how he's going to go about rescuing sinners. And there are three ways that God goes about it in this passage, and three ways, I think, that are clear in the ways that he goes about it in everyone's life. The first is he begins with a sovereign intervention. I may be putting it a little lightly. It's not like the world is happening and God once in a while sovereignly intervenes. No, by sovereign, we mean that he is over all. He is providentially superintending all. He is commanding all things to his purposes, including a great wind upon the sea. Remember, he's the one who made the sea, and he's the one who can tell the sea what to do. We know that God's plan includes a terrible storm such that it threatens Jonah's boat to sink. And yet God reveals sovereignly, not just through the storm, but through this casting of lots. You understand, they're rolling dice to figure out whose fault it is for the storm, right? And sovereignly, God makes it come out on Jonah. Why? Because Jonah then preaches to them the gospel. He's not intending to. He's just fessing up. He's feeling guilty. But he tells them that he fears the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. And suddenly the sailors who had been praying to gods, you notice that, many different gods, pick one, find one that's going to solve this problem, suddenly realize, oh no. You're telling me there's a God? There's a Lord? There's one Lord who rules? And we're... Against him, Jonah? God sovereignly intervenes in the storm and in the casting of the lots to show their need for a savior. Who is this? That even wind and waves obey him. He is the Lord. He is the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. He is the God whom Jonah presumed to serve. He is the God who calls Jonah even still. The God who calls a storm. Who thought that storms had a vocation? He calls a storm when Jonah tries to run away. He calls a massive fish or a whale to save Jonah from drowning. And he calls this fish, appoints him, the text says, to vomit Jonah onto the dry land and say, go. And preach my sermon to Nineveh. It's almost funny and it's utterly profound. You cannot escape God's plan. That's what it means when it says that he's sovereign. He's the king. He says, do this, and it is done. And he sovereignly overrules evil and works salvation. God accomplishes this good even when it's hard for us to see, hard to understand. Lord willing, as we look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, we're going to enter into the life of a church that saw it very hard to see how God was sovereignly at work in their society, and yet God's word is plain. He is working salvation, even in the shape of a fish, even in the shape of a cross. When we say, thy will be done, we're not giving God our permission. We're sitting in the presence of the Lord in communion, fellowship with him, accepting as faithful servants to be a part of God's plan. As for those who say, my will be done, those who flee the presence of the Lord, it's like the Johnny Cash song. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, God will cut you down. 
Of course, that is not the whole picture. And of course, if that were the whole picture, Jonah himself would have been cut down. But we see a second aspect of God's great rescue plan, and that is in his gracious affliction. God does not cut Jonah down. He does not cut Nineveh down. He didn't even cut down the pagan idol-worshiping sailors who were in the boat with Jonah. Why? Because God is a saving God. He cares for the souls of these pagans. And yet he cares about them so much, he is willing to afflict them, to send them to the storm. And Christian, it's not any different for us today. Some of you may have had literal uh, storm moments where it was actually the the story of Martin Luther, uh, the great Protestant reformer. He devoted his life to God as a monk initially because of a thunderstorm. Actually, he cried out to St. Anne, but ultimately to the Lord, But there are metaphorical storms, parabolic storms in our lives that come our way. Why does God let this happen? If he's saving you, Christian, he's saving you through the storm. Are you going to trust him? As Jesus called Peter to trust him as he walked out on the water. We see that fierce mercy is writ large through the storms that occur in the stories of the Bible, particularly in the story of another Jonah. You did not spend three days in the belly of a fish, but spent three days in the belly of the earth. Jesus actually says to the hard-hearted Israelites of his day, you will see no sign of me, but the sign of Jonah. The sign, just as Jonah was three days in the sea, I will be three days in the earth, and I will be raised up just like Jonah. Jonah, however, imperfectly gives us a picture of, a glimpse of this perfect prophet, Jesus Christ, this perfect leader, this perfect revealer of God's will, this perfect servant who did not run or shy away from Nineveh, but who came down, who actually smelled like us, looked like us, suffered immeasurably more than us, and saves us from our sins. He is the mercy of God. The mercy to whom all mercies point. Lamb of God, as the hymn says, for sinners wounded, sacrificed to cancel guilt, none shall ever be confounded who on him their hope have built. That's the ultimate mercy, that God would not spare his own son. Jonah thought this was an exceptional circumstance. I'm going to Nineveh. Look how terrible this calling is. The calling of Jesus was far more egregious, and yet he was willing, at every stage, willing to go, willing in all the ways that Jonah wasn't, to be tempted, beaten, mocked, crucified. For our sakes, Jesus was. Nineveh didn't have the whole picture. Not even Jonah knew how God would accomplish salvation, but this much was clear to them, that all who call on the Lord will be saved. All who call on the Lord will be saved. Even Nineveh, even Jonah, even you, and even I. And it leads to a third element of this great rescue plan as God is going to gloriously, graciously afflict. He wounds to heal like a surgeon cutting to make well. We see this third element now, this glorious proclamation that comes out through this affliction. Jonah calls out, he identifies himself as a prophet of the Lord. Where do we find the people in the boat? I think this is one of the most amazing things in the whole story of Jonah, and it's one of the most easiest to miss. God's grace is almost caught second hand by these people. They were not the intended target, at least not as far as Jonah was concerned. From Jonah's perspective, it was Nineveh he was called to go to. And yet even through Jonah's backwards, faithless service, God is going to save not just Nineveh, but these men in the boat. We're not given their names. We're not given their history. We don't even know necessarily. We know they were bound for Tarshish. We don't know where they came from. But can you see in this passage how God, even through a little grace is able to work a great salvation through a glorious proclamation. They give glory to God. 
They feared the Lord exceedingly. That's not to say that they were afraid of him. That's a language in the Bible for they revered him. They devoted themselves to him. They offered sacrifices to the Lord and made vows to him. Christians who who have joined in this church, members of Delta Oaks, you have made vows before men that you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. These men made vows. And the Lord used the sin of Jonah to bring it about. God works a glorious proclamation. But of course, that doesn't mean then we should sin so that grace may abound. The question that we should all be left with here as we look at these men who called out to the Lord, is have we done the same? As we face the storms, as we face this affliction, have we seen it gracious to us? Have we seen Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith in it? Have we seen his righteousness that covers and cancels all of our guilt? Have we seen him ruined so that we Ninevites, who without faith, without God in the world, received the benefits of this glorious conjunction, but God, who is rich in mercy through Jesus Christ, brought us and made us alive in him. By grace, Paul writes, you are saved through faith. It was at great cost, and it should encourage us. If Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, can go to the cross and bear our sins, we who are called, united in him, receiving the same Holy Spirit, can we not then fulfill our vocations as witnesses in whatever way that may be? In the ways that you have been placed, in the stations that you have been given, you have been given them by God. Will you serve him there? Will you devote yourself to him there as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as an employer, as an employee, as a neighbor, as a friend? Because it's there in those vocations, even in the ordinary conversations, that God's glorious proclamation can happen. God does something special. I get up here and I preach. It's God who's speaking by his holy word. And yet, we are all called as this holy priesthood to give an answer for the hope within us. Church, are you prepared to give that answer? Even if it is in the midst of a storm like Jonah, are you prepared to give that answer? I am the one who fears the Lord who made heaven and earth. As I live, the Lord says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. Why will you die? That's God's question to the world. That's God's question to the Bay Area, to Pittsburgh, to your neighbors, and to you. Why will you die? Trust in me. Trust in the Lord. And lean not like Jonah on your own understanding. I want to conclude with a prayer. It's actually a prayer taken from a a hymn, a Charles Wesley hymn that I've never sung, never heard sung. I doubt you've ever heard it sung either. It's called Weary of Wandering from My God. Uh, It's one that was pointed out to me by... um, in my studies this week by one pastor, and I think it's, it's precious for the Christian. Remember, the non-believer doesn't know God's grace. They need to, but they don't know it. But you, Christian, who know God's grace, know that you need his mercy continually. I need thee every hour. And so this is the prayer I'd like to conclude with here. Would you bow your heads as we pray together? O oh, Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I have sinned. Yet once again I seek thy face. Open thine arms and take me in. And freely my backslidings heal. And love the faithless sinner still. Thou knowest the way to bring me back. My fallen spirit to restore. Oh, for thy truth and mercy's sake. Forgive and bid me sin no more. The ruins of my soul repair. And make my heart a house of prayer. Ah, give me, Lord, the tender heart that trembles at the approach of sin. A godly fear of sin in part, implant and root it deep within, that I may dread thy gracious power and never dare to offend thee more.
We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord God, for your loving kindness that sovereignly intervenes and graciously afflicts and gloriously, graciously proclaims redemption and resurrection for us. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.